7.0 earthquake striking near Acapulco, Mexico, about 200 miles away from Mexico City. Let's take a look at some of the videos that we are seeing coming in on Twitter tonight. The mayor of Acapulco saying so far no reports of casualties. The Associated Press reporting that there were no early reports of significant damage. Of course, we'll keep on checking that. But right now, moving over to the pandemic. A record-breaking number of children testing positive for COVID-19. The latest number from the American Academy of Pediatrics shows that the U.S. reported more than 251,000 cases among kids during the week ending September 2nd. Yeah, that is the largest number of child cases in a week since the pandemic began. That's according to AAP. Uh, data from the state shows the number of positive cases among st uh, students in Texas public schools has steadily climbed since August 8th. Sabinal ISD, just one of many school districts in the state that has been forced to shut down campuses due to COVID. The night team's Patty Santos spoke to a mother who says her eight-year-old son got that virus from school. That's right. She shares what it's like to watch him fight the virus in hopes of people will mask up and get vaccinated. 24 hours after she found out her son Anthony was exposed to COVID, Victoria Ibarra was in the ER with the eight-year-old. He couldn't walk. He would cry because his bones were hurting. It was so cold. It was just, it was really scary. He's still fighting a 100 plus degree fever. His entire third grade class is quarantined this week, along with the Sabanon Junior High and high school campuses. She blames mask reluctance. In some classes, teachers wear masks and other classes don't wear masks. So it's like a 50-50. We're closing in on 40 cases in four weeks of school. Uh, again, last year, everybody wore masks. This year, we're lucky to get 50%. Superintendent Richard Grill says legally he can't require his staff and students to wear a mask, but he's imploring them to or the campus closures will continue. We just want to teach kids. We want to keep our schools open and we need everybody to work with us to understand that is our mission, period. About 12 teachers from Sabadell Middle and High School are out. With a staff shortage, both schools are expected to be closed until next week, so students will need to learn from home. Frankly, we just can't find subs. Um, a lot of our subs are retirees, and they're frankly scared about being uh, around COVID. Left without power to mandate masks, superintendents can only plea. In the end, the kids suffer because if we're not having school or we're having substitutes in the classroom, uh, they're just simply not learning. And educators ask that staff and parents really be informed about the protocols in place when returning to the classroom when they've been exposed to COVID or if they had COVID. The Uvalde Health Authority says overall infections and hospitalizations are looking like they're going down and, and that will hopefully help the school district settle into the school year. Jaffney. Thank you, Patty. Meanwhile, mask wearing continues to be a very heated issue. One woman showing her frustration outside a local HEB. Her comments directed at Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, who has pushed for mask mandates in schools and government buildings. Putting masks on kids, that's child abuse. He's a traitor. Nelson Wolf's a traitor and a communist. That video circulated on social media. A spokesperson for the county says no one was harmed. Judge Wolf defending the mask wearing effort, saying now is not the time to let down our guard amid this pandemic, saying we should continue to move cases on a downward trend with these safety measures. The COVID-19 positivity rate dropping another three points this week. We are now at 7.6%. The risk level, moderate. In the past seven days, we have seen an average of 1,200 cases per day here in Bear County. No new deaths were reported, but we are nearing 4,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. Tonight, more than 1,200 COVID-19 patients remain hospitalized. 19 of those are children. Now we want to take one of your questions through the trust index. One question we've seen online asks if monoclonal antibody therapy is the same as the COVID-19 vaccine. Here's what we found. 
The therapy is used at the Infusion Center at the Freeman Coliseum, where more than 1,500 people have been treated since last month. Hundreds of people are also receiving the therapy in Kerrville. The president and CEO of Peterson Health says this therapy is used for people who are already infected with COVID-19. An eligible patient would need to get the treatment within 10 days of symptoms, and a doctor's order is required. The therapy is to prevent hospitalizations and reduce viral loads. This therapy, it's effective, but it's not the replacement to get the vaccine. We still strongly encourage people to get the vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccine is also known to help keep patients out of the hospital and is given before a person becomes infected with the virus. The protection of the therapy is limited. The Texas Department of State Health Services confirms even after receiving the therapy, a patient would still be advised to get the COVID-19 vaccine 90 days after treatment. As our trust index finds, the claim that monoclonal antibody therapy is the same as the COVID-19 vaccine is not true. And if you see something on social media you want checked out, share the claim with KSAT. Just log into ksat.com slash trust index. Taking a look now at other stories we've been following today. Right now, the search is on for the gunman who shot out windows of a tan Buick and sent the driver to the hospital. This was all near Highway 281 in Mulberry. Take a look. Police found the victim parked in the Wells Fargo parking lot. That man then taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Police are still trying to figure out what led to that shooting and if this might have been a road rage incident. Investigators believe the suspect was driving a white SUV in the northbound lanes of Highway 281 before that shooting. Officers say a gun was recovered in the Buick, but right now it's unclear if the driver returned fire. And new details in that deadly shooting that ended at a gas station this weekend. This was a scene Sunday near Hackberry Street and Aransas Avenue on the city's east side. Police believe the victims were driving down Olive Street near Martin Luther King Drive when they were shot. Three victims in the car were shot. One of the men told officers the driver was injured so badly he couldn't drive and had to be placed in the passenger seat before driving to the gas station. A 17-year-old in the back seat died, but so far an identity has not been released. There appears to be some confusion surrounding a controversial announcement from the Bear County Commissioner's Court. Ahead of the budget, commissioners propose reallocating 12 positions from the Bear County Sheriff's Office to different constables' offices. Now, a proposal Sheriff Javier Salazar is opposed to. Salazar says that the 12 positions being looked at to be removed from the Sheriff's Department include deputies who work with the SWAT team, the Criminal Investigation Division, and Dispatch. He says he is all for growing other agencies. However, he he doesn't want that to come at the expense of the sheriff's office. That, that myself and every one of the deputies from the Bear County Sheriff's Office are geared toward public safety. And in any position that they take uh, from the sheriff's office directly puts the public at risk. And that's that's unconscionable to me. And I won't allow it without at least having my say. Now, we did bring the, those sheriff's concerns to Judge Nelson Wolf during tonight's briefing, and this is what he had to say about reallocating those positions to constables' offices. We did have uh, 12 people that were working in the sheriff's office that handled uh, warrants. Well, they're supposed to, they're budgeted for warrant. I don't know what he's doing with them. He may have used them for some other services, but I think that the constables would be also in the same position of being able to do it. Of course, we'll keep tracking this proposal. An official decision is expected to be made by the end of the week. The countdown is on for a Texas State House race anchored right here in San Antonio. Democrat Leo Pacheco left his District 118 seat to take a job with San Antonio College. Governor Greg Abbott announced a special election to fill the spot, and it will happen on September 28th. Candidates who want to throw their hat into the race will need to file their application with the Secretary of State by Monday at 5 p.m., Early voting will start September 20th. That race announced after the new Texas voting law was signed. Less than an hour after Governor Greg Abbott signed that measure, the nation's largest and oldest Latino civil rights organization filed a federal lawsuit. LULAC claims the bill would suppress voter turnout in communities of color. The measure bans drive through voting and empowers partisan poll watchers. Governor Abbott and his supporters argue the law makes it harder to cheat despite no proof of widespread voter fraud in the state. So that's what Texas is about, turning out people to vote and making sure the elections are fair and honest and cheaters are caught. It's not about protecting voter integrity. There is no voter fraud. That's the big lie. The big truth is their voter suppression. 
Governor Greg Abbott says he is extremely confident the voting measure will remain law. LULAC's president says it's likely giving the Republican majority on the high court. In an effort to break down any barriers, Valerie Reifert with Radical Registrars is asking Mayor Ron Nuremberg to make the general election a citywide holiday. Now we're nearing the 20 year mark since the 9-11 attacks. A gold star mother that calls San Antonio home is sharing her experience since the life altering attack next on the Night Beat. More than 7,000 U.S. service members have been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001. The conflict in the Middle East triggered by the unforgettable attacks on our country on September 11, 2001. The mothers of some of those killed in action make up the American Gold Star Mothers Services Organization. Now, the president of the Alamo area, American Gold Star Mothers, shares what she remembers about the life-altering day and the years following that attack. The 19's Patty Santos with her story. I joined the military because I came from a line, long line of those who served. Retired Chief Warrant Officer 5 in the U.S. Army, Candy Martin, was in a military supply training workshop when she watched the second plane hit the World Trade Center. It was just such a feeling of, oh my gosh, our country is under attack. For the first time in her 26-year military career, she was told not to wear her uniform. When we came back in the next day, all of us were in civilian clothes. We were advised not to put on a uniform and to go anywhere into the city at that time. She was quickly put in charge of supply and logistics for her Army Reserve unit to get them deployment ready. I focused on their equipment, focused on what they still needed for their personal gear that they needed, as well as the unit equipment that they needed. In 2005, she was deployed to the Green Zone in Iraq. The mother of four had a strong support system. Her husband, also retired military, was holding down the fort back home. I really feel sorry for my poor husband during that time for, time period. I had been in a war in a war zone for 12 months and I'd been home for about two months and then our son, our only son, is getting ready to, to deploy back to the same war zone. Her son, First Lieutenant Thomas Michael Martin, was a natural born leader. He enlisted straight out of high school and in 2005 graduated from West Point Military Academy. He was very, very proud of that military legacy that our family had and he just knew that he wanted to serve. He arrived in Iraq in September 2006. He was a platoon leader and he had 12 soldiers that were underneath him. They were the sniper platoon. His goal was to get his platoon home safe and he did, but he didn't. Tom was the 53rd soldier that was killed out of that brigade and never made it home. In her eyes, 9-11 changed everything for our nation, the world, and thousands of families like hers. I think the world in some ways is better because he lived, sadly because he died and how he died, but I do believe that he's still making a difference today. Even after her loss, she continued to serve her country. She retired after 38 years and nine days. Martin has been a local, state, and national leader with the American Gold Star Mothers. Martin's family has also created a scholarship in her son's honor. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Patty, thank you. And we continue our coverage surrounding the 9-11 attacks tomorrow. Nearly 20 years later, the effects of that day continue to have an impact. Tomorrow on the Night Beat, we hear from an Army veteran who was only 13 years old at the time of the attacks, but whose life was transformed. Let's take a live look outside with live cam on this Tuesday evening. It was 83 degrees. We just lost a degree, Sarah. Uh, not too bad out here, but we're also keeping a very close eye on what's happening in Mexico tonight. That 7.0 earthquake hitting near Acapulco. Uh, there was a tsunami warning that went out, but that uh, does not appear to be a threat at this point. Not a threat to the United States, that's for sure. Although any time that we get these big earthquakes, it does result in some kind of risk for a tsunami. And 
as we've stated, this is breaking news, so we're just getting uh, new information out as it comes. And of course, we'll have more information on KSAT.com. But yes, there's a major earthquake in Guerrero, Mexico, just about 10 miles northeast of Acapulco. It was a 7.0 magnitude earthquake occurred uh, likely about 45 uh, minutes ago to an hour ago. What well, it's impressive about these very strong earthquakes and a magnitude seven earthquake is very strong is that you can often feel the the shocks many miles away from the earthquake center and in fact in Mexico City 200 miles to the north there of where this earthquake was uh, buildings were swaying so again this is breaking news we're going to continue to keep up with it you can find more information on ksat.com meanwhile back to here our weather here in San Antonio as you know yesterday was our first 100 degree day for this year measured at the San Antonio International Airport. We usually see about 18 100 degree days every year, although we're running out of summer here, so I don't think we're going to get to that number by any means. Back in 2009, though, we hit 59 100 degree days and 57 100 degree days during our rough drought of 2011. A lot of people have been asking me, but Sarah, my, my backyard has measured 100 degrees a lot so far this year. Well, there's a difference between uh, your backyard thermometer and the official thermometer at the San Antonio International Airport. Now, one thing is, is a uh, oftentimes the backyard thermometers are in the direct sun, but the official thermometer is always shaded. It's housed in the Stevenson box where white paint reduces the heat absorption. It's in shade and it's placed four feet above the ground. So that's why we use that as our official uh, thermometer reading. 101 though was the high in Laredo, 103 in Del Rio, 97 in New Braunfels and 97 in Gonzales. We did have some areas of rain, not around San Antonio, but near Kerrville, Lakey and out toward Del Rio, there were some gusts winds and some lightning earlier today. All of that rain has dissipated and instead what's in our forecast for the next couple of days is this ridge of high pressure. In the summertime high pressure brings heat. Look it's still 101 in Las Vegas and 100 in Phoenix this evening. What I'm showing you here is the atmospheric content around this ridge of high pressure. Anywhere you see these purples and blues that's very low moisture content. Very low water content in the air and that's going to be moving over closer to Texas and San Antonio making us dry and hot. But by the early part of next week, we are going to see some tropical moisture, a fetch of tropical moisture work its way in from the Gulf. And this is going to be bringing us rain chances starting Sunday, but really primarily Monday and Tuesday as that tropical moisture lingers around South Central Texas. So tomorrow, Wednesday, we'll be waking up mostly sunny, 72 degrees, 92 by noon, a quick warm up there by 20 degrees. And then in the afternoon, we're going to be at 100 for the high. Now, keep in mind that there is a very off chance 10% for a stray storm, but the odds are it's just going to be a sunny and hot day. West northwest winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. We'll be near 100 over the next few days, but the good news is our humidity, our dew points will be lower, so that means no heat index value for us in the afternoon. So what you see is what you get on the thermometer, and at least we won't have any uh, heat index value, although 100 degrees is hot no matter which way you oh, shake yeah. it. A little bit of rain, though, early next week, Jaffney. People will definitely be cranking up those air conditioners <laughs> this yep. week. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Greg, when UTSA kicks off its uh, home opener at the Alamo Dome this weekend, something will be missing. Yeah, a major change. Uh, talked about today and executed today and that is the rallying cry that they have used since 2016 in football games is going away when we come back we will tell you why and is Amari Cooper the best wide receiver in the NFL let's ask him coming up I definitely feel like I'm back in rhythm right now. I'm ready to go. Um, obviously, I'm still trying to trying to sharpen things up, but yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go. The Cowboys $100 million wide receiver declares himself 100% ready for the season opener in just two days in big board sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys have restructured the record-breaking contractor star quarterback Dak Prescott to create $5 million in cap space. In order to do that, they made $6.2 million of Dak's four-year $160 million deal into a signing bonus as Prescott prepares to play in his first game since week five of last year when he suffered a compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle. One of his star wide receivers 
receivers, Amari Cooper, is coming off ankle surgery as well. That kept him out of all of the offseason workouts and most of the preseason. But that hasn't lessened his opinion of his abilities going into his seventh season in the NFL. Do I think I'm the best? Yes. Uh, have I proven it? I wouldn't say I have. You know, there, there are other guys who, um, who have actually put up some great numbers. You know, they've, they've had... They taking advantage of their opportunities and stuff like that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just still trying to take advantage of my opportunities and still trying to uh, put up those numbers to lead the league um, in yards, touchdowns, all across the board, really. And only after I've done that will I will I say I'm the the, the, the best um, and, that, and that I've proven myself to be the best. I don't think I've proved it yet, though. But do I think I am? Yeah. The UTSA Roadrunners return to practice today following arguably their biggest win in school history, their 37-30 victory over Illinois on the road this past Saturday. Their first win ever over a Big Ten team, only the second win ever over a Power 5 school, their first being Baylor, 17-10 in 2017. Now they shift their focus to their home opener this Saturday in the Alamo Dome where they host Lamar. And one thing they want to repeat is that balanced attack that included 217 yards on the ground led by Sincere McCormick with 117 yards on 31 carries and 280 yards in the air. Brendan Brady out of Steele High School is also part of that ground attack with two touchdowns against the Fighting Illini. It's a good feeling to just be able to help your team any, anywhere possible. Um, you know, I don't really look at it as far as my uh, individual stats or anything like that. I'm just trying to help the team. Um, and, you know, sincere, he had 30 carries. That's a lot for any guy in college football. Um, and, uh, you know, I just got to tip your hat to him. Just being able to carry basically the offense on his back for 30 carries is incredible. Um, so any chance I get to go in there and just relieve him of that for a little while, you know, I'm going to go out there and give it the, give my all because just that's that's how I've been wired to play. Um, you know, I just I just want to be able to help my team and, and being able to stay healthy and do that for game one. It was definitely huge for me. It was, it was a blessing. Kickoff in the Alamo Dome this Saturday, except for 5 p.m. in case Central Sports will be there. UTSA President Taylor Amy has decided to do away with the university's football rallying cry, Come and Take It, which originated from the Battle of 1835 in Gonzales. His action comes after two professors on campus found the saying racist towards Mexican-Americans and asked, for it to be removed from the Roadrunners' $41 million brand new race facility. It has also been used in some political protests. Amy writing the phrase has become increasingly incongruent with UTSA athletics. Another battle on early of unbeatens in big game coverage. Next. Here we go. One of the big games in our big game coverage this Friday night will feature another battle of the early unbeaten Central Catholic versus Alamo Heights. A button surprise a lot of folks in the private school was able to knock off Southwest, a 6A school in their season opener, 31-7, and followed that up last week with a dominating 44-7 win over Bernie Geneva for a combined 75 points while allowing only 14. It has earned the buttons a number four rank in 12's top 12 sub 5A poll. For Alamo Heights, the Mules are also off to a 2-0 start with a big comeback 34-30 victory over Bernie. And then last holding off Churchill 21-13. That has moved them to number seven in 12's top 12 among the class 6A and 5A schools. I know they're a strong team. I know they're good. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a fight. Every snap, it's going to be a battle. So it's going to be a good game. We needed all the momentum we need. Uh, Central Catholic, they're a really good team. They got a really good quarterback, really good defense, and we're going to need all of it to get past them. All right, kickoff at the newly renovated Orem Stadium this Friday night is set for 7 p.m. High school volleyball tonight, Pleasanton, a little shorthanded due to the COVID-19, calling on JV players to step up and take on YWLA at home. Eagles lead by a set, but they're battling back from a huge deficit in the second. Grace Keelich gets a shot to fall in the center court. The Eagles have clawed back from down five and to lead 22-21. Lady Cardinals respond. Madison McCaig catches the defense off guard with a dump shot. That ties the match at 23. Home team answers right back. Tess Underbrink to Sadie Makeda for the emphatic spike. The Eagles take a wild set 27-25. They go on to win three sets to one. We have more highlights and reaction from this match and a five-set thriller in Divine on our website later tonight. In fact, Andrew just got back on the drive from Pleasant, threw those together for us, and he has more later tonight on our website. Fresh out of the camera. You got it. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> we'll be back. Following breaking news out of Acapulco, Mexico, this is a video of a house during a 7.0 magnitude earthquake earlier this evening. Still, this is a breaking story, so more information will be coming out. You can find more on KSAT.com. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and take a look at our weather back at home. We are going to be hot over the next few days, 100, but lower humidity. Earlier uh, next week, we'll have the chance for some rain. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.